Hello, welcome back. Now we are moving to lecture 25 and we are going to start studying the gas uh, in a little bit more realistic fashion. So, so far we have considered that the gas was following the ideal gas law. Uh, we found that it works pretty well in many instances, but we also found that it failed at, for example, low temperature. Um, and we saw that this was due to the fact that uh, we do, did not in, uh, include interaction between the gas in, uh, in, in the ensemble of, of particles. So in the next two lectures, including this one, we are going to look into a, a more realistic description of gas. In the first uh, lecture, 25, so lecture 25, in this first lecture, we will consider uh, the ca cases when the gas uh, and remember, gas is not just uh, gas uh, like, like molecules, it can also be photons, phonons, and things like that. So we are going to consider the case where the gas, the, the velocity is such that we need to use a relativistic description of the kinetic energy. In the next lecture, so lecture 26, we will include interaction, uh, the interactions between the molecules and between the particles in the gas. Um, so that will be our next lecture. So for this lecture, we are going to study relativistic uh, gas. And, and uh, again, we will see that all the machinery, all the mathematics that we have developed so far, and all the formalism can be applied fairly straightforwardly. And in fact, from a standpoint of thermodynamics and the formalism, uh, looking at relativistic gas is not harder than looking at a, a non-relativistic one. We're just going to see the differences here, but but formally there is no difficulty really. So let's go right into it. So this is the, the kinetic energy uh, when we take into account relativistic effect. So the it's coming from special relativity where uh, m is the rest mass and c is the velocity of light, the, 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 light, uh, the, the speed of light. P is the momentum, okay? So now very, very often uh, we can work in the non-relativistic limit because the momentum uh, is very small or the, the mass is very large. So the, the ratio between the momentum and the mass is much smaller than the, the speed of light. And in that case, we can uh, tailor, uh, we can use a Taylor series of the energy uh, which I've not uh, done here in this screencast, but I think it's it's actually fairly straightforward if you if you develop the square root of uh, one plus uh, p square of m. Uh, I'm going to let you do this. Uh, we find that the energy, uh, the kinetic energy, is p square over two m plus m c square. And of course, m c square is what you see in 50% uh, of all the popular uh, t-shirts of uh, of popular science. But in our case, we are going to ignore it. It's the rest mass energy. So the mass is, is M is the rest mass. So the re rest mass energy in our case, in this for this purpose is just a shift uh, in, uh, in the energy. So we end up with a situation with the kinetic energy is P square over two M, which is what we have used uh, since day one in this course. Uh, and of course, if we imagine that the momentum can be written H bar K times K, where k is the wave number, then uh, we find the kinetic energy as a function of the wave number being h bar square k square over 2m. This is nothing new. We've used this uh, abundantly in this course so far. Um, but what we want to do is the other limit. And the other limit is when p over m is much larger than c, uh, when that number is, is very large. And so we want to see uh, what, is, what it actually means uh, in that case, what we find is that uh, when p of m is much larger than c, we can drop the second term that we have right here. And then we end up with the e squared equal to p squared c squared. In other words, the energy is equal to pc. So e equal pc for the, is for the case of an ultra relativistic system. Uh, okay, so for example, that would apply to photons. So usually we, we like to write uh, the energy for photon, for example, or, or phonon, as we've seen uh, in the previous lecture, is h bar omega, where omega is the angular uh, frequency. P is h bar times k, and c, yeah. So that allows us to uh, 
simplify a little bit and find that the omega is equal to ck. So this is actually an equation that we've used before in this course, in the, in the last two lectures. And we call that the, rela the dispersion relation, uh, which it actually provides the frequency of oscillation as a function of, wa of wave number. So remember the wave number k is actually two pi over lambda, lambda being the wavelength. So this gives you the relationship between between the frequency of oscillation and the wavelength of the of the of the of the oscillation. Now, this is a v simply a linear uh, relationship here, as opposed to a uh, to a parabolic relationship that we had for the non-relativistic limit. So this is how things change between the two. And so you can argue that the linear term is actually easier to deal with than the than the uh, a quadratic term, but for really uh, from a mathematical standpoint, it makes very little, dif very little difference. However, we expect that many things will change uh, when we look at, uh, for example, partition functions. So let's just try to summarize what we, what we have, because this is the starting point for the entire lecture today. Uh, the actual relationship, p square over 2 m plus mc square, is actually, uh, 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 which is the actual one for the non-relativistic limit, is this parabolic uh, uh, description, okay, with just a shift of mc square here. And the actual uh, solution, the full solution, the, using the relativistic formula, is, the, is this uh, full uh, curve here. And the limit at very high momentum is going to be given by a linear relationship. And you, you see, of course, this linear relationship goes goes to zero because there is no shift in here. So this is what's going to happen. And today uh, we have worked a lot here in this area. And this is usually where regular particle, I mean, molecules and so on live, but photon and phonon lives in this area. And this is where we are going, we're going to work. Of course, this slope here is given by the, the, uh, the, the, the speed of light, which is, which is a constant in, a, let's say in vacuum, for example. So let's try to do this. Let's try to to redo everything we've done, but instead of using um, using the quadratic term, we are going to use this linear term for the energy. Okay. Uh, one thing that's going to be, should become very obvious to you is that when we did the equipartition theorem and then look at all the consequences of the equipartition theorem, the the magic of the equipartition theorem was that the relationship, all the relationship were quadratic. So all the energies depend, energies terms depended on a quadratic function of position, of velocity, and so on and so forth. And it's why we had the equipartition theorem. Here, uh, the energy term is a linear term, it's not a quadratic term. So we do expect that the number of, uh, of, of uh, findings in the case of relativistic gas will be different from the equipartition theorem. In fact, they, they will definitely be different because we don't have a quadratic term. I just, just kind of a spoiler alert here. So we are going to consider an ultra relativistic gas and we'll suppose a particle of a finite mass. So the first thing we always do is to calculate the partition function. Of course, we know that if we know the partition function, we can, we can know everything. For, we're using the formulation that we have described at length in this course and applied a number of times. So for a single particle, we just we simply do the sum, so in other words, an integral in this case because it's a continuous variable, and we have the Boltzmann factor with the energy h bar k c. H bar k c is simply p c p equal to h bar k, and the density of state g k. So g k d k is the number of state that have wave number k that's between k and k plus d k. This is a usual thing. Now we suppose that the gas lives in a box of volume v. And that will allow me to write the density of state. Uh, this is an exercise we've done at least two or three times already, but let me remind you how it works. Uh, this, imagine living in, in three dimension uh, for the k vector, and the, the k here is just the length of the k vector. So we want to know how many states are between k and k plus dk. When we say that, we mean that k is of length k and k plus dk. So the way you do this is you have to divide the volume of the shell that's that's between of radius k uh, that's that's between radius k and k plus dk, which is of course the surface of the shell, um, uh, four pi k squared times the the, the 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 thickness of the shell, which is dk. Uh, 
And you divide this by the volume of each state. And of course, at the each states, we've seen from quantum mechanics, because we impose a wave function to live in a box, so to have the boundary condition, uh, the boundary conditions means that uh, the cubes, the, the cube in the state, uh, the, the, the volume that each state occupies is 2 pi over L uh, cube. And of course, the L cube is V and everything uh, end up, ends up being simplified. So I invite you to go back to, to a previous lecture where we had the uh, uh, schematics to explain this, but that is very important to know. So the point is that the density of state is, is a quadratic term in K, okay? So we end up, of course, with Z1 is equal to, to, this, to this integral. And here we just replace X to make the notation a little bit simpler. And the main reason we do this is because if you look at the table of integral, you see that this, is, this integral is exact. And in fact, it's, uh, it's, it's exact. And you can, you can find that the, from the exact value of this integral from zero to infinity, you can actually write an identical solution for the partition function of a single uh, relativistic uh, gas. So remember, the, the partition function is related to, to an integral of all the possible energy state. And uh, we know the energy state being given by this linear relationship. So this is slightly different from what we had for a free non-relativistic particle, because uh, in a free relativistic particle, we had an, a, a square in, this, in here, so it's a quadratic term. But the point remains is that, that we can write uh, the partition function in a notation that's somewhat similar to what we did for, for the gas, that, for the, the non-relativistic gas we had before. If you remember, we had volume over the thermal wavelengths cube. Here we, de we define something that looks like, a, like a, a thermal wavelength, but we use capital lambda instead of lowercase lambda. And that capital lambda cube is given by uh, what's on the in the red box on the right-hand side. This is different from what we, we had for the non-relativistic case. Uh, so one thing that's very important is to realize that the partition function Z1 depend over one over T cube, right? The, the, the cube coming from here and the one over T coming, coming from here, even though for the non-relativistic case, we had minus three half. Uh, and this is coming again from the fact that we have a different, different uh, uh, dependence on the energy um, uh, between the relativistic and non-relativistic case. And we see that this term here is going to have a profound effect on a number of, of physical phenomena. So it's time to calculate the thermodynamic properties now that we know the partition function. Well, we know the partition function of a single particle. It would be interesting to know the partition function of, of the gas itself. Uh, so, we, uh, so let me try to explain that. Uh, let me just rephrase what I said. We know the partition function of a single particle in a gas. Now we have multiple particles in that gas. And if we imagine that we have an ideal gas, uh, they are not going to interact with each other. And in, in other words, we can write the partition function as the product of the partition function. Now, um, if we suppose that they are indistinguishable, we also need to add the factor n uh, uh, factorial. So this is something that we discussed at length in the previous uh, lecture. I just like to remind you that the, uh, the, when is this valid? This is going to be valid so long as the density of gas is low enough. Um, and, and I'd like to, to, to stress this. If it, this is only valid when there are many more states available, then there are particles to fill them. In that case, this n factorial is actually this, this approximation is very, very good. Very nice. So uh, we are going to use, as always, the logarithm of the partition function, which we can calculate here. Uh, what we find when we do this, we, we, are, we often have constant here. And th these constants usually do not matter when we look at uh, a number of thermodynamic potential, but they will matter, as always, when we, are, we will be interested in the entropy. So we'll come back later in a couple of slides and calculate explicitly the constant. But for now, we can consider that the, 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 the logarithm of the partition function of the ensemble of particles in the gas I go going to be given by this formula and a constant here. So each time we have a derivative, we don't have to worry about this. In particular, for the internal energy, you remember the internal energy is minus the derivative of this with, function, with, with respect to kBt, 1 over kBt. Uh, 
And then we do this, we find that the internal energy is 3n kBT. Now, if you remember what we've done for the um, non the non-relativistic gas, we find we found that uh, the energy was actually three half n kBT. So there is a factor of two, and this factor of two again comes from the fact that we have a linear uh, relationship. Uh, it, I mean, it comes it comes from the mass that that because we are using a linear relationship. So we can also calculate the heat capacity, which is the derivative of u uh, with respect to temperature. Uh, at constant volumes, if we were interested in CV. And of course, this is straightforward to calculate. Uh, we obtain the CV is 3 NKB. And one more time, this is different from what we found for the uh, non-relativistic uh, gas. Uh, and uh, and, and we, we also realize that uh, this is different from the equipartition theorem. And this is something very important for students to, to remember that the reason why it's different from the equipartition theorem is that the equipartition theorem does not apply to the relativistic gas. The reason why it does not apply to relativistic gas is because the uh, the energy the, the the energy function, if you will, is not a quadratic uh, function of variable like velocity or momentum or position. Okay, so that's clear. So we've done this. We've done internal energy and heat capacity. We've just done this in the previous slide. We can also get other thermodynamic properties by applying the, 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 the formulation that we've seen before, for like the Helmholtz function, which is minus kBT ln of Zn. And again, we find this, this, this value here. Uh, and then we can calculate the pressure. Uh, if we go back into the, again, the list of, of all the formulation, the formula that we've derived, it's know that the pressure is minus the derivative of the Helmholtz function with respect to volume at constant temperature. And then we find, after doing all this, that P is equal to NKBT. Now, this is something that's uh, quite interesting. It's uh, because P equal NKBT, since N is a density of, of charge, so uh, a density of gas molecule or, or gas particles, really. Uh, and uh, lowercase n is capital N of volume. So we find, we find again, PV equal uh, NKBT, which is the ideal gas law. So the ideal gas law applies to both relativistic and non-relativistic case. In fact, the, the, the ideal gas law uh, uh, ex expects you to ignore all the interactions, uh, attractive and repulsive. And this is exactly what we've done here. So the ideal gas law also applies to the relativistic gas in this in this approximation of of uh, uh, neglecting the interactions between particles. We are going to go back to to introducing the the uh, interaction between particle in the gas in the next uh, lecture, and then we'll see uh, the effect it will have on the thermodynamic properties. So we can also calculate the enthalpy again u plus p v, and and again get a formulation here. Uh, this is not something that uh, I would ever ask a student to remember by heart, but it's a, probably a good idea to know where to find them and to know how we got them. So we can also calculate the entropy, uh, but uh, remember that what I mentioned a second ago, so the constant that I was telling you, we need them because uh, for the entropy, uh, we do not calculate the derivative, so we do not get rid of the constant so easily. So if you go back to the formulation for the, for the uh, uh, partition function, uh, for the for the n uh, n particle of uh, particle of gas uh, that are in in uh, ultra relativistic gas, we find th this formulation again. This is from something from we had before, where where capital lambda is defined by this. It's just a reminder that will that allows me to calculate the, uh, a number of properties again or again the Helmholtz function that we've seen, but now with the constant given explicitly. Uh, we can also get the Gibbs function, but interestingly, we can also get the entropy. So we get the formulation for the entropy, and this entropy here is nothing else than the entropy for a relativistic gas. So it would it would apply to photons, for example. So that's that's all nice, all good. So we can ho can have all those formulations. There is a lot of equations here, but please do not worry about the equation. This is not something that we ask. We typically ask students to remember what we remember. What we ask students to do is to understand uh, how the equation work, equations work and have been derived. So before we, before I move forward, I'd like to 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 remind you that uh, we found the internal energy to be three nkBT, 
And we find the, found the pressure to be NKBT. It's something that we find in, in the previous uh, two slides ago, and I even mentioned to you it was the ideal gas law. So what matters in this case of the relativistic case, uh, we find therefore that the pressure is one third of the internal energy, okay? Uh, if you do remember this equation for the non-relativistic case, we found that the pressure actually, actually it's fairly easy to remember because the pressure for the non-relativistic case was also P equal NKBT, that's the, the, the law of ideal gas, the ideal gas law, while the internal energy was three half NKBT, which was related to the equipartition theorem. So in that case, that means the pressure for the non-relativistic case was actually two U over three. So you see, this is actually a very important effect because the pressure in a relativistic, for a relativistic particle is half that of the pressure of a non-relativistic uh, situation for the same energy density. And in fact, this factor of two seems um, innocuous, but it's very important. In fact, it has extremely important consequences on star formation because as star formations are mostly uh, led uh, and governed by, uh, the re by, by relativistic particles. So this is a very, very important thing. In fact, this is just one example of a difference between uh, uh, the properties of a relativistic system versus a non-relativistic system. But there, there, is another, there is a couple other one that I'd like to mention before uh, we, we conclude this screencast. And for that, I'd like to talk to you about the adiabatic expansion of, uh, expansion of an ultra-relativistic gas. So remember, it's an adiabatic, so no heat in or out. Again, this is what we, we know. Um, that means that it, because, of, because of this, uh, we do have, uh, if there is no heat uh, in or out, uh, there is no change in entropy. So if there is no change in entropy, uh, the entropy that we just calculated, is, which is given here, uh, we can actually uh, find some consequences of the fact that the entropy is constant. In fact, we know the number of particles is constant, Kb is a constant, so that means that this term here has to also be a constant. So that means that this term n capital lambda q, which is given by this formulation, you have to go back two slides, uh, is, has to be a constant, right, since entropy is a constant, so this, this term is a constant. We have plenty of constant in this, okay? Uh, we have lots of constant, but what we f but uh, the point is that what is not constant is v t cube, one over v t cube. So I mean they are they are not they are not constant of nature. That's what I mean. So that means that one over v t cube has to be a constant in order for all this to be a constant. Is all the rest is already a constant on its own. So v t cube is a constant. So that's that's a that's a very important result because if you if you do remember we can use the ideal gas law to replace the temperature, right? Uh, in fact, we can replace the temperature by uh, uh, using PV equal to nKBT, and that means that we we replace um, the, the the temperature and we we obtain that PV to the power four third is a constant. Uh, now. Back a number of lectures ago, maybe 10 lectures ago, we looked at the important effect of the Carnot cycle. And when we did the Carnot cycle, we looked at the adiabatic expansion. And then we did the adiabatic expansion, uh, we found that we had PV to the power gamma is equal to a constant. And gamma had been identified as the ad adiabatic index. So the adiabatic index, uh, four third for an ideal gas of relativistic particle is four third, uh, which is of course, uh, sorry, I'm going to go back a little bit here, which is, which is, uh, which is of course different from the one that we found uh, for uh, the relativistic gas. So that's, that's an important, that's an important result that we have right here. Okay, so that allows me to make, to make an important, uh, to have an important consequence of this. And we are going to compare this to a, to a non-relativistic gas in a second. So PV, uh, Vt to power three is a constant is for a relativistic particle in the gas. So that means that the temperature depends on, on one over uh, cubic uh, root of V. Now, if we suppose that V is like a volume, uh, like a cube of length A, V, uh, a, a square, uh, 
I mean, cubic root of V uh, is therefore related to the side of the cube, so it's A, okay? So in other words, one over cubic root of V is, it, is equal to one over A, A being the side of the cube. Well, it's not necessarily a cube, but it's, it's kind of a measure of the, of the length, length scale, so we are going to call it a scaling factor. So it's a scale factor. So in other words, the temperature uh, goes down lin uh, as one over the size of the box. Okay, so if there is an expansion of the universe, I mean, since there is an expansion of the universe, that's why temperature goes down uh, as uh, uh, linearly with the scale factor. Okay, so the temperature of the cosmic uh, microwave background that we've discussed uh, uh, two lectures ago is inversely in proportion to the scaling factor of the universe. So there's a reason why temperature goes down and has reached a value of about 2.7 uh, today. And so we can actually trace back what the scaling factor. This is, a, this is of course, true for the relativistic particle. Now, if you remember, for non-relativistic part non particle, we found that the, the uh, adiabatic index was three third, and not uh, uh, actually it's not the adiabatic index here, but it's uh, it's related to the adiabatic index. But we found that instead of vt cube, because the, the, the adiabatic index is pv to the power gamma. But we can we can actually get the, the adiabatic index by introducing the the gas the, the ideal gas law. And in any case, what matters here is that instead of vt to the power three for for a relativistic particle, for a non-relativistic gas, um, we have vt to the power three third is a constant. Now, if we do the same exercise here, we find a temperature would actually go down as the square of the scaling factor, so much faster. So that means that imagine now, you go back in time using your time machine, go back in time and imagine that you have a certain amount of relativistic and a certain amount of non-relativistic gas back in time. And then you, uh, the, the universe is going to expand uh, with a scaling factor A going, getting higher and higher. Now what happens is that, um, the 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 relativistic the non-relativistic gas are going to cool much faster than the relativistic one. Actually, that one is going to uh, cool down as one over a, the other one is cooled down as one over a square. That's an important result. Now, here's an even more important result, and this is going to be my last slide before the summary: is to look at the density of the expanding universe. So remember what we are trying to do here is to compare the effect on the relativistic uh, particle versus the non-relativistic particle. We already know that the temperature of the non-relativistic particle is going to go down much faster than the temperature of the relativistic ones. That's what was on the previous slide. Now here's the idea. For non-relativistic gas, the density of course goes as one over the volume, okay? That means that if I go back on the previous slide with my scaling factor, the density goes one over a cube, a being the scaling factor. Good. Now, for the relativistic gas, we we know that the density, okay, the density is actually related to the internal energy U divided by c square. Okay. So that's then this is a result that we we obtained from uh, from from the fact it's a relativistic gas. Now. Uh, the internal energy, we discussed this, the, the internal energy for relativistic gas is U equal, equal to 3P, P being the pressure. We also found that, uh, we found that PV to the power 4, 3, 4 third is equal to a constant, therefore the pressure depends on the volume as V to the power minus 4 third. So that means that the internal energy here is also going to depend to the minus four third, and since uh, using the relationship with the scaling factor, we find that the density of the relativistic gas goes as a to the power minus four. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that the density of the non-relativistic gas is going to decay uh, much slower when A increases, then the density of the relativistic gas. So in other words, we can say, and this is what I said, what we can say is that the early universe was radiation dominated, radiation being relativistic, uh, 
So it was the radiation has decreased a lot faster than the relativistic gas, while today the universe has become matter dominated. And the reason being that if we imagine that there was a similar amount of balls at the beginning, I mean, this is, this is not exactly correct, but uh, that's the point remains is that if we had a given amount of each at the beginning of the universe, at the early universe, the, the amount of non-relativistic uh, uh, particle has decreased much slower than the amount of relativistic one, just because of, of these relationships that we had uh, from, uh, from uh, thermodynamic uh, by comparing the relativistic and non-relativistic uh, particles. Now, this is a summary. This is a, taken from the Blundell and Blunders book, and this is the kind of place this is the kind of thing that you, that you, of course, don't want to necessarily remember, but know how to get. And this is a summary of a, a table of the summary of all the properties that you, you find for relativistic and ultra relativistic, uh, the ideal gas of, of those relativistic or relativistic particles. So I'd like to attract your attention. I mentioned that a couple of times. The, the adiabatic uh, index is five third for non-relativistic particle and four thirds for ultra-relativistic ones. And this is this is th this this coefficient here is is the trace, is the signature of of whether you have a relativistic and non-relativistic non gas. Um, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for your attention and the next screencast will be on trying to come up with something a little bit more realistic uh, to describe a gas. Uh, by going beyond the ideal gas law uh, by introducing interactions. Thank you very much.